the the man within my head i'm i'm stunned by the title i'm also stunned by the cover of this book <laughs> the cover of this book in no way would make someone in a bookstore know immediately that this is a book about Graham Greene. Well, my publisher felt that a book with just Graham Greene on the cover might induce the unsuspecting browser to imagine that it was a literary testament or a piece of literary criticism, which is not an exhilaration to the casual browser, and not a de depiction of this book either. I do think that anybody who buys this book on the basis of the cover will be very disappointed because there isn't much about my father and me and what there is is very, very sketchy. It has um, to do with the title and the omission of Graham yes, Greene on you. the title. Thank you. So the title I had as often before the book because Graham Greene's first book was called The Man Within and it's about hauntedness, possession, Jekyll and Hyde, the many selves we have inside ourselves. But I had a full ponderous title to define this book as non-fiction. A, a year before I sent it in to my editor, it was called The Man Within My Head, colon, Graham Greene, Hauntedness, and the Parents We Never Quite Know. And then sitting at my little desk in rural Japan, after six months, I thought, no, let me make a greater space for mystery. So then I sent it to my editor, The Man Within My Head, an inquiry, which I think all my books are and most books are. And then finally, just before I sent in the last version, I said, no, let this book hover somewhere between fiction and non-fiction. Let me give the reader no clue about how to categorize it before she begins or even after she's finished. Let me put the reader on alert, on edge, not knowing what she's going to get into, and just have this title which could be fiction or could be a novel or could, be, could refer to any kind of man within my head. So again, I was taking more and more things away to leave space for the inexplicable. He's a context, he's a pretext, but he's a real subject too. It's much easier to see yourself when you're reflected back, when it, you're externalized. When Green was beginning to make his name as a novelist in the 20s, he suddenly put all his fiction aside and he wrote a biography of the 17th century poet and rake, the Earl of Rochester. And when I read that book now, it tells me nothing new, unexpected or fresh about the Earl of Rochester. But it tells me everything about Graham Greene. In other words, I think he realized and divined, literally, at an early stage in his life, how he could see and tell his own story under the guise of a biography. So Greene, the, the pretext, Greene, who permits uh, Pico Aya to, to write a little more than his reticent self of flesh and blood shows. We also might have learned um, a resistance and yet an openness to say something slowly. <laughs> resistance and openness, that's, that's the heart of this book, sure, yes. And but the, do you know what I'm about to say? <laughs> no, I'm butting okay. in again. <laughs> okay, um, you are. I will continue. Re resistance and slowness to perhaps... Openness. And openness, uh, to, so thank you, to slowly approach a subject which is complicated, um, perhaps extremely complicated, which is a subject of your father. Mm. And you, you speak about the fathers we have, mm. the biological fathers, mm. and the fathers we have in our head. Mm. Um, those that haunt us, and green being one, I know there's a Talmudic saying that the only thing we really choose are our parents. Very. That's perfect. That's, isn't it? That could have been the epigraph also, yeah. It isn't Thoreau, though. But it, I'm, I, it is a Talmudic saying, and it's always surprised me because, of course, the only thing we do not choose yes. are our parents. Yes. And you write. In every book, there's another text written in invisible. Uh, another text written in invisible ink between the lines that may be telling the real story of what the words evade. It did make me think, you say, again and again of the fathers we choose, sometimes even from books over the ones we inherit, real fathers unlike conscripted ones, sometimes misplaced their sons, 
and then spend all their lives wondering how they can ever get them back. Mm. So, Graham Greene, would it be correct to assume, is what permits you to write about yourself? Yes. yes. Um, Graham Greene is what permits you to write a veiled autobiography? Yes. Our brilliant other common friend, Richard Rodriguez in Santa Barbara, when he read this book, said, Graham Greene's just a pretext. How can anyone think it's about Graham Greene? <laughs> and I said, not so fast, my friend. <laughs> so go slower. Take your time now. Yeah, all right. <laughs> that was very quick, so to speak. But with Greene, there'd be no need of words at all. He knew me better than I knew myself. I knew him better than I knew Louis or my father or many of the people closest to me when it came to his secrets, his sins, his most intimate needs. I closed the door of my father's final temporary residence and got back into my car to drive up the hill to where a rebuilt house, no longer yellow, sat alone on a ridge and a quiet American inside a faded orange book was ready to keep me company would talk about the importance of never mocking innocence too readily and the snarls that invariably turn around compassion. Thank you very much. Thank you.